please, a very warm welcome for Ms. Jennifer Weiner. I saw someone walking that way. I know. And I was like, okay. Right. It's all a mess. Thank you. Hi, vloggers. Hi. Um, okay, so um, we need a universal signal about the bra. Um, if you can see it, go like this. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Not kidding. <clears throat> um, I want to thank Roger for that lovely introduction. Um, a couple years ago, I did a reading at a bookstore that had had a flood, and they had to reschedule. Um, and when I came three days later to do the reading, they held it in, in the um, loading dock, basically, of this bookstore. And the manager is leading me back to this room, and he is incredibly apologetic. He's saying, we've never had to do a reading back here before. I'm so sorry. I hope this is OK. Um, and I, of course, as the oldest child of divorced parents, am trying to tell him, like, don't worry. It's all going to be fine. I'm sure it'll work. Mom and dad still love us, even if they can't <laughs> live together. So we, we get to this room. I will never forget it had a concrete floor with a drain in the center, sort of Jeffrey Dahmer-esque kind of things. And um, he, he um, walked through the crowd, stood behind the podium, leaned into the microphone, looked at the crowd, and said, here's Jennifer Weiner. Sorry about the smell. <laughs> and I, yeah, um, usually they wait till I'm done speaking before they say that, so. But it was really awesome. Everybody who, who came, I signed their books, thanks for coming, sorry about the smell. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And um, I, I want to start by saying I know I'm kind of a um, slightly freakish choice for this presentation. Um, well, I have been happily published by Atria Books, a division of Simon & Schuster, for 12 years and 10 books. I am not a publisher, although I am happy to try to make shit up if you want to ask about how publishers do things. <laughs> My publisher's actually here somewhere. I hope she uh, makes stuff up about how they do things. Um, yes, while I have been blogging since 2002, um, I'm not exactly the kind of book blogger that most of you guys are. Um, my blog is as likely to talk about The Bachelor as it is about publishing. So why me? Who am I and why am I here? I think that what I bring to the table this morning is my own success in the world of social media I think that I figured out a way to um, use my blog and Facebook and Twitter and lately Pinterest to have a conversation with my readers, to find my own personal line between the share and the overshare and not merely deliver a buy my book monologue. So let me take you back to 2000 when I sold my first book, lo these many years ago, um, there was no such thing as social media. Stephen King's e-novella, Riding the Bullet, which I remember downloading for 99 cents, reading at my desktop and hoping my boss at the newspaper wouldn't see me, was presumed to be the future of e-books, and there were only the most primitive e-readers available. Websites, weblogs, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Kindles, Nooks, and iPads, all of these have emerged in the last decade and um, have left publishers and authors um, scrambling to figure out how to use them, how to use these new technologies to connect books to readers. So I want to start with the good news. There has never been a more exciting time to be part of the conversation about books and reading than there is right now. Once upon a time, when I was young, there was no conversation at all. There was instead a series of overlapping monologues with critics, authors, and readers, each in their separate spheres. The critics would issue their edicts from on high. That's God. It's, it's old school God. I looked for black female God, but couldn't find her on Google images. Um, readers would discuss the books in real life and usually in private. And that, wait, that's my mom's book club right there. Notice what they're not reading. <laughs> Fuckers. Um, when, when I went on my first book tour, I took my mom with me, as you do. And we're, we're good with the bra, Megan? Bra's good? Okay, thank you. Um, so I took my mom, and I'd be in the bookstores, like, talking to the owners and talking to the clerks and being all nice and pleasant and, you know, like, trying to make a good impression. And I would hear my mom, who is super friendly, talking to other bookstore patrons, and she'd say, I just read the best book. And I'd be like, okay, here it comes. She'd be like, it had 
everything. Oh my God, great characters, this amazing plot, and it was funny, and it was moving, and I think, here it comes. And I would turn around just in time to hear her say, Richard Russo's Independence Falls, have you read it? It is great. I was like, Fran, okay, no, no. No, no, unless we find out that Mrs. Russo is in Maine hand-selling copies of Good in Bed, you can't do this shit to me, okay? So, critics talk to readers, readers talk to each other, and authors, well, presumably authors were voiceless and silent between books, holed up in their garrets in New Hampshire compounds working on their next opus. That's J.D. Salinger drinking his own urine. He did that. That's, I read that. Um, okay, so aside from a letter to the editor, a book tour, a reading, a visit to a book club, or if you were Richard Ford spitting on a critic at a party, authors, I, I couldn't find a picture of that, I tried. Um, authors really did not have an avenue for interacting with their critics or their readers. If an author had something to say, she'd say it in her next book. We had three separate spheres, critics, authors, and readers. All of them were talking. None of them could talk to each other. So, sad Venn diagram, please, <laughs> right? Um, my assistant, Megan Burnett, did the sad Venn diagram. That's, that's Megan, and thank you for that. Um, neither of us are artistically inclined, so, but we do our best, okay. Um, and then along came the internet. Suddenly, readers could talk to each other. That's a Q&A that one of my favorite, um, this is, this is chicklitisnotdead.com did with Emily Giffen. Do, is Liz or Lisa from Chicklet Is Not Dead? They're not here? Anyhow. Um, they're awesome and I love them. Um, okay, so readers could talk to authors. Authors could talk to critics. That's Neil Gaiman chatting with Laura Miller from Salon. Authors could talk to other authors. That's me talking to Gary Steingart. Who thought we would ever see the day? Um, and let's see, authors could talk to other authors. The critical landscape, which had been looking bleak, had been revitalized. Now anyone with a laptop and an opinion could call him or herself a critic and publish a review on the book of the moment or the book of 20 years ago or talk online to other readers and maybe even critics and the author herself about her opinion. The world had opened up. While the world was expanding, so was readers' access to authors' lives. No more was our knowledge of our favorite writer confined to what we could glean from the book jacket and a 20-year-old headshot. And I say 20-year-old headshot because like, I always in my head thought I'd get a really great one taken and use it till my face fell off. <laughs> and with the internet, you can't really do that anymore because you just don't want to have that moment in bookstores where you walk in and you say, hi, I'm Jennifer Weiner, I'm here to do the reading. And they're like looking at the book and looking at you and looking at the book and looking at you, <laughs> looking at the book and looking at you. <laughs> and saying, can I see some ID, please? <laughs> you don't want that. Okay, so um, we can go to authors' websites, because of course authors all have websites now, not to mention Facebook fan pages and Twitter accounts, and we can see pictures of their houses. That's Jane Green's house. Or their spouses. That's Emily Giffen's husband. Or their vacate, I know, right? <laughs> Like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> um, or their vacations. That's Nicholas Sparks in, in Italy someday. Um, or their kids. And that's um, Jody Picot's daughter slash co-author. I got to figure out how to get my kids to earn some fucking money. <laughs> they're nine and four and a half. I think they're ready. <laughs> Readers can email our thoughts on, their, on, their, on author's latest books. We can tweet at Judy Bloom. Um, if you're my age, you might want to just like sit with that for a minute, <laughs> let it sink. You can tweet at Judy Bloom, right? And sometimes she tweets back, and it is awesome. Um, of course, this brave new world of overlapping conversations and unprecedented access was not without growing pains. Consider the rise and fall of the woman I would identify as the world's first book blogger, Oprah Winfrey. Okay. Yes, okay, Oprah technically did not begin with a book blog. She had a televised book club, launched in 1996, lasting until 2000, 2010, and inconveniently for me, revised last Friday. <laughs> Fuck you, Oprah, my speech was done! <laughs> okay, but if Toni Morrison can call Bill Clinton the first black president, and Newsweek can call Barack Obama the first gay president, then I can call Oprah Winfrey the, the world's first book blogger. 
Okay, so Oprah's televised book club had all of the hallmarks that would come to characterize book blogs in the ensuing decade. A fresh, enthusiastic voice, a tone that was worlds apart from the educated dispassion and cool remove of book critics dispensing their judgment. Oprah didn't sound like a critic. She sounded like a friend. The woman next to you at the soccer game or the carpool lane who couldn't wait to tell you about the amazing book she just read and how much she loved it and how much you were gonna love it too. And it was probably Richard Russo's Independence Falls. <laughs> um, every book that Oprah picked became an instant bestseller, ensuring that every writer unlucky enough to publish during the age of Oprah had to deal with well-meaning relatives who would pull you into a corner and whisper in the tones of having just received a divine revelation, have you thought about sending your book to Oprah? <laughs> yes, Nana, yes, I thought about sending my book to, oh, didn't really do any good, but I thought about it, yes. Okay, so um, not all traditional critics were happy watching a chat show hostess more famous for her yo-yo dieting than her erudition commanding an army of readers. Oprah didn't care. At least she never responded publicly to the people who told her that she was doing reading wrong, that she was picking bad books, that she was trespassing on territory better left to the better educated. And then along came Jonathan Franzen, <laughs> whose dealings with Oprah would demonstrate the perils of the interactive world where readers and critics and authors can talk to each other instead of just about each other and the conversations play out in real time. Okay, so everybody in this room probably knows what happened. September of 2001, Oprah pricks Franzen's The Corrections for her book club. Franzen, a, a self-proclaimed writer in the high literary tradition, who takes himself very seriously, went on what I would describe as a kind of foot-in-mouth world tour. <laughs> While Franzen allowed that Oprah had picked some good books, he told an Oregon public radio station that she'd also, quote, picked enough schmaltzy one-dimensional ones that I cringe. Clumsily backpedaling in USA Today, he acknowledged that Oprah had done a lot of good, that she was a hero, but not, quote, a hero of mine, per se. <laughs> you sort of had to wonder where the publicist with the taser and the hook was at this point. Because I know if I'd done that, like if Oprah had picked my book and I'd said anything like that, like I think my publisher would have held me down and muzzled me until it was time to be on the show, right? I mean, like, d did he not want to sell a million books? Like, what, what was going on there? Anyhow, okay, so stung, Oprah rescinded her invitation, saying that Franzen was clearly uncomfortable about coming on her show and that it was never her intention to make anyone uncomfortable. She is so classy. <laughs> I would not have been that classy. But it's what happened to her book club in the wake of that mess that would foreshadow blogger, author, publisher interactions in the world to come. You know that old Eleanor Roosevelt saying about how no one can make you inferior, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. It's my belief that Oprah Winfrey respected Jonathan Franzen, respected all writers a lot. When he said essentially that her picks were unworthy, that cut deep. Three books after the corrections, Oprah shuttered the club. When she started it up again, she stuck to the classics until her disastrous 2006 choice of James Fry, whose memoir turned out to not be what the kids call true. <laughs> After that egg meets face moment where Fry's publisher, Nan Talese, went on TV to proclaim that readers did not deserve anything better than the appearance of truthiness as opposed to actual truth, Oprah's picks tapered off, becoming once or twice a year events instead of monthly ones. In December of 2010, the club limped off into the sunset with the safest of safe choices, Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, and Great Expectations. <laughs> they had the worst sales of any previous picks, probably because most of us had read them in 10th grade. <laughs> the book club had become irrelevant. Oprah had become just another critic, marching in lockstep with the Times and the New Yorker, playing it safe, adding her limp, belated Me Too when they heaped laurels on Cormac McCarthy or Jeffrey Eugenides. If Oprah was one of the first book bloggers, then I was one of the first wave of novelists who used blogs to invite readers to step into our parlors and into our lives to share intimate details about when on, what went on behind the scenes and between the books. As an ex-newspaper reporter, um, someone who typically enjoys human interaction, 
The chance to talk to readers, to get my words out there and say something in the year-long silence between novels was a thrilling opportunity. I remember going to my publisher and saying, I'm going to start a weblog. Then I remember going to my publisher and explaining what a weblog was. <laughs> in January of 2002, I launched what was then called Snark Spot. That was my weblog name. And as bloggers did, I treated my life as material. I wrote about my family and my dog, my seemingly endless first pregnancy, my Bradley Method birth classes, and taking my mom on book tour where our publisher would put us up in really nice hotels. My sister and I used to do Mutual of Omaha inspired voiceovers. We'd watch my mom sort of like wander through the lobby and we'd say, the animal out of its habitat is clearly uncomfortable in this strange new environment. Let's watch as it approaches the mini bar. And my mom would turn around and say, put those Oreos down, girls. Do you know how many cookies you can buy for $5 at the grocery store down the street? Are you blogging this, Jenny? <laughs> um, so I, I put it all out there. I wrote about my family. I wrote about my kids. Um, and some of what I wrote about came from the bad place. Did the world really need a sentence by sentence, word by word, deconstruction of Curtis Sittenfeld's New York, Time ta New York Times takedown of Melissa Banks' new novel, which she slammed for being chick lit? Maybe not. Curtis and I are actually friends right now, so that, this is actually cool. Um, she reads my books every year, and I read her books every five when she writes them. Um, but remember, this, these were the early days of blogging, the days when you could, indeed, dance like no one was watching. And for me, knowing that books like mine, with naked legs and cheesecake on a pink cover, were unlikely to be hailed as the successor to Salinger or Updike, blogging was a chance to defend myself and my genre. To be a voice that said, in spite of the cutesy covers, the breezy tones, the bad boyfriends and bosses, in spite of the legion of detractors, and eventually an entire anthology challenging my genre's worth, some of those books had something to say. I'd found my voice, and then along came the New York Times. In 2005, I got a call asking if I'd be interviewed for a story about mothers who blogged. I said, sure. Um, note to future people who get calls from Times reporters, beware the reporter who begins his interview by stating, my wife loves your books, okay? Because what that means is, I don't read that shit. <laughs> Some of you will probably remember the Moms Who Blog story. As it turns out, the Times was not so much a fan of quote unquote mommy blogs. The headline of the story was mommy, parentheses, and me. And in the first few paragraphs, the reporter observed that more often than not, the moms who wrote these blogs were narcissists, and the sites were, quote, shrines to parental self-absorption. Narcissism? Self-absorption? Seriously? I didn't even know I was writing a mommy blog. I thought I was writing a blog about being a mother with a job. I thought I was being funny and informative and helpful to the rest of the struggling new moms trying to balance work and family and the inevitable loss of identity that goes along with becoming woman pushing stroller, or these days, woman wearing sling. <laughs> I imagined I was sort of an Irma Bombeck for the E age. Then again, I also didn't know I'd been writing chiclet, so it's usually the Times that has to tell me this stuff. <laughs> Then, in the summer of 2005, just before the film version of In Her Shoes came out, the paper sent a reporter to my house in Philadelphia to do a profile of me for the Sunday magazine. I cannot tell you how excited I was. Even though the reporter they sent was better known for her hit pieces than her Valentines, this meant they thought I was interesting. Oh my god, maybe it would be one of those pieces that would make everybody want to read my books. They like me. They really, really like me. <laughs> Long story short, not so much. The Times didn't think I was interesting as much as I was a symptom of what it saw as literature's wrong turn, a turn towards social media and public connection as opposed to artistic isolation and dignified silence. I can only recall bits and pieces of my day in the reporter's company. My subconscious has helpfully blocked most of it out. But there are things that I do remember. Like the reporter wandering through my bedroom, picking up a photograph of my sister, considering it with a sneer, and saying, well, she's not that pretty. I thought that was you. 
Okay, um, those of you who've seen or read In Her Shoes know that it's about these two sisters and one is very good looking and one not so much. So I, I was standing there thinking, you just insulted the fuck out of both of us. <laughs> um, I remember her asking me over lunch, do you write your blog so that people will like you? And oh, if I'd just been the tiniest bit quicker, I would have said, no silly, that's what the blowjobs are for. <laughs> Did my publisher leave yet? <laughs> um, low jobs, yeah. Okay, um, bottom line, as the day went on and there were 10 questions about my blog for everyone about my books, it became apparent that the piece was not going to, resemb not going to resemble the paper's 4,000 word mash note to Jonathan Safran Foer that it was instead going to be something that I regretted possibly for the rest of my life. When I told the reporter that we were done, that I wasn't going to sit for the portrait and there wasn't going to be a story, she was furious, complaining bitterly about the time she'd, quote, wasted traveling to Philadelphia and reading my books, which erased pretty much all the doubts I had about what the story was going to be like. No one can hurt your feelings without your permission. I gave the New York Times permission. Um, and I should maybe give you a little background about this part of the speech, because when I told like, my agent and my, my best friend and um, my publicist I was going to talk about this, they're like, maybe you should just say a large northeastern newspaper. Um, you know, because if they piss off the times, they're going like, to take it out on your next book, which is um, it's called The Next Best Thing, and it comes out July 3rd. And I thought about it, and I said, OK, what else can they do to me? What other painful, embarrassing thing can happen? Can they have Henry Alford say something bitchy about me in the style section? Oh, that happened. Um, can they quote Jonathan Galassi, who is Jonathan Franzen's editor, making fun of my made-up German? Oh, that happened too. Um, can they misrepresent my sales on their bestseller list? Well, this week, my current paperback, Then Came You, is the number eight best-selling trade paperback on BookScan, which is said to account for 70 to 80% of all sales. And for the same time period, it's number 22 on the Times list. Um, and I know what will happen, because this is what happens with every book ever since 2005. My publisher will go to the Times and say, we think Jen's book should be higher on your list, and here are our numbers supporting this claim. And the Times will say, we think Jen's book is right where it should be, and we're not showing you our numbers. They're proprietary. Um, and there's nothing to be done, and I don't expect any better. A sale is a sale, and as long as I know that people are reading my books and enjoying them, I really can't do much about what the Times says or where they put them on their list, even though it sort of is a bummer. Um, but, you know, anyone who's taken a women's studies class can tell you this. As long as there's a woman who writes about her own life, there's someone, sometimes a man, sometimes another woman, sometimes an entire institution, it's there to tell her that what she's written is unworthy, unimportant, beneath notice, not real literature, not worth taking seriously. <laughs> In the years to come, I was still writing my novels, the Times was still ignoring them, except I think in the 2009 Vagina Roundup. See, I told you I would say vagina. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Where, where Janet Maslin allowed that, quote, Ms. Weiner's characters are warmly and realistically drawn, which would have been nice if the article had not been headlined, The Girls of Summer Surveying This Season's Chicklet. Vagina Roundup. Um, and literally, literary writers were still stepping up to tell me that my novels were unworthy and I should be turning my skills toward more serious matters. Um, Jane Smiley actually reviewed certain girls in the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, and she had no way of knowing this, but that article came out the day of my daughter's Hebrew baby naming, which meant that my entire extended family was in town to read the paper. <laughs> that sucked. I mean, because like there you are, like standing up in temple. It's like you, your husband, the baby, and everybody like, Jane Smiley, dag. <laughs> Anyhow, I loved writing my novels. But in terms of blogging, I was going through sort of a dark night of the soul, second and third guessing everything I wrote. Is this an overshare? Is this too personal? Is it silly? Is it disreputable? Is it girly? Who am I writing for? My mom, my readers, the reporters and editors of the Times, the paper I'd spent my entire life reading. I had lost my social media mojo until Twitter, The Bachelor, and my fellow writers helped me find it again. I was a Twitter resistor. 
I'd been pulled onto MySpace. I liked Facebook fine. I thought, do I really need a new microblogging site, just one more item on the daily to-do list? As it turns out, novels are fine and blogging is fun, but Twitter could possibly be the thing that I was born for. <laughs> Twitter's taught me discipline, the skill of being funny or poignant or pithy in 140 characters. It's let me connect with readers in a more intimate way than I ever could before. It's let me talk to other authors and hang out with them around the virtual water cooler to talk shop. It's given me people. Twitter is like being at the biggest, best cocktail party in the world where I can talk about almost anything to almost anyone. Big books, reality TV, making an ass of myself in front of Jeffrey Eugenides, or how when your three-year-old says she just wants to hold the bottle of sparkly red nail polish, she is totally, totally lying. <laughs> Best of all, Twitter has given me a place to light a candle instead of cursing the darkness, a place where I can not only point out sexism and discrimination in the publishing world, I can actually do something about it supporting other authors in ways that weren't available when my first book was published. And it's something I think that all bloggers can do for books they love. Case in point, I adored Sarah Pakanen's first novel, The Opposite of Me. And I remember the women who blurbed Good in Bed when it first came out. Women who had no connection to me at all, not through agent or editor or publisher. They just liked the book. When I got those blurbs, I swore that I would never be a non-blurbing writer that if I had a chance to help debut novelists as a way of paying forward the gen generosity my peers had shown me, I would do it. And social media gave me the chance. Sarah had smartly recognized the importance of pre-orders in getting her book on people's radar. She organized a contest and lined up prizes for people who ordered the book the Tuesday before it was published. I decided that for that day, I would offer a signed copy of one of my books to everyone who ordered Sarah's. The response was more than I think any of us imagined. I tweeted up a storm, linking to Sarah's first chapter and where you could buy the book, and eventually mailed out more than 400 copies of my own books. The opposite of me cracked the online bestseller list at Barnes & Noble and Amazon and went into its third printing before it had been published. The book and Sarah also got written up on a bunch of blogs and even newspapers that might have dismissed her book as just as her excellent book as another piece of disposable <coughs> chiclet. And my new path was clear. I continue to do Q&A and interviews and giveaways with Emma Donahue, whose book Room Took the Country by Storm, and with Liz Moore, a fellow Philadelphian and rising star in literary fiction, whose book Heft Broke My Heart. I've been thrilled to help spread the word about writers from Jillian Madoff to Julie Buxbaum to poor Buzz Bissinger, who only got one Times review instead of the two I thought he should have expected. I am so pleased to be in a position to do this, instead of just complaining about the Times bias, that I can now be part of someone else's magic, that I can be the one sprinkling the fairy dust. If you've got a blog, you can do this too. I'm not saying never write bad reviews or that there's no place in the world for some well-deserved snark. I'm not saying not to be honest. But there is something to be said for talking up the things you love instead of talking down the things you hate. And so, in closing, bloggers of 2012, I would tell you this. <laughs> no matter what you blog about, there will always be someone there to try to slap you down, to tell you it's unworthy, undignified, silly, and girly. Ignore them. In Oprah's day, blogging existed as a corrective. It filled in the blanks that mainstream critics ignored, considering the books and genres that were beneath them pointing out what the mainstream was covering badly or missing entirely, and bloggers continue to serve this role in different and dazzling ways. Janice Herrera, aware that statistically women writers are underrepresented on review pages, pledged that 50% or more of her one-minute book reviews would go to women. Carlene Bryce launched when, right, when White Readers Meet Black Writers, a quote, sometimes serious, sometimes lighthearted plea for everyone to give black authors a try. In her video, she demystified the choices, pointing out that books by black authors are, quote, made of paper, just like other books. That's not too scary, is it? Twitter is a place where Jody Picot and I can tell the world that the New York Times does not cover popular fiction by women the same way it covers popular fiction by men. It's a place where Slate's website for women can tweet statistics supporting that, indeed, women are less frequently reviewed. It's where any number of other tweeters can say that Jody and I are just jealous and bitter and PMSing and that our books suck. 
And the conversation rolls on. Because as painful as it sometimes feels, social media is a conversation, and there's always someone new to talk to and something new to talk about. As a writer, Twitter has been invaluable. It's let me listen to my readers. It's let me ask them for help when deciding where to buy ads or even which author photo to use. My favorite example in The Next Best Thing, coming out July 3rd from Atria Books, <laughs> one of the main characters is in a wheelchair. I found Priscilla Hedlund, who blogs as Wheelchair Mommy on Twitter, and she was kind enough to take an early look at the book and tell me what I got right and what I got wrong. As bloggers, you help readers just by being there, by tweeting about what you're reading, by answering our questions, by covering the books and genres that mainstream, the mainstream ignores, or covering popular books in a way the mainstream can't. Anyone could review Chad Harback or do a Q&A with Kate Christensen. But how many people would think to do a video of them baking protein bars with Harback or ask Kate Christensen for her playlist? When the mainstream zigs, bloggers can zag. Where dead tree writers are stuck with the demands of the form, 500 words with a thumbs up or thumbs down at the end, with attention paid to big releases from big houses, bloggers are limited by nothing but their own imagination. Bloggers can be passionate where their print peers have to be objective. They can be silly, enthusiastic, cheerleaders who'd shout the good news from the mountaintop when they found a book they loved, or gleefully eviscerate something they couldn't stand. And it's been a pleasure to watch that passion make its way from the mainstream as the circles of the Venn diagram have overlapped and melted into non-existence, where writers who got their start on blogs now review for NPR and mainstream critics do video reviews with their heads draped in breakfast meat. <laughs> so, advice. I would encourage you to be as transparent as possible, to remember that some of those old rules about conflict of interest and full disclosure were in place for a reason, to ensure that the reader was getting a review untainted by money or personal loyalty or rivalry. If your blog has a money-making component that's not as obvious as an ad or a tip cup at the bottom of a review, spell it out as clearly and visibly as possible. Speak in your own voice with the courage of your own convictions about the books and authors and topics you love, no matter who tells you you shouldn't love them. Dance like no one's watching, sing like no one can hear, Tweet like your mom is not online. <laughs> be brave, be smart, be creative and kind. Above all, be yourself. And I promise readers will find you. Thanks.